those of you who read Zoomer magazine may know that I uh, write a uh, chapter in, in an ongoing thing that I call the Zoomer philosophy. And uh, recently, uh, I wrote about the magic 100, about hitting 100. And, and what I brought out in that article is that uh, not too long ago, the Queen used to handwrite uh, greetings to everyone in the Commonwealth who turned 100. And of course, she's no longer able to do that because that number has ridden, risen so, uh, so rapidly. It used to be that one person in 10,000 might reach advanced age. And yet, in an article written in The Lancet, The Lancet is arguably the most prestigious medical journal on the planet, uh, the writer prophesied that of the babies born today, one in two might hit 100. Now, I'm interested in hitting 100. And in, in <laughs> preparation for that chapter, I asked people around me, would you like to live to be 100? And it was interesting to note the number of people whose first reflex was no, because they think that aging is the same as decline, that aging is equated with decay. And uh, in the chapter, I uh, mentioned the fact that those people who live to be 100 actually live uh, with enormous health. They have a kind of ideal trajectory where instead of a long, painful, and expensive decline, they have full function and then kind of abruptly and in short order just stop. So I was thinking, what can I do to get myself into that kind of a zone, and in my research I've discovered only a few things that are practically reliable for achieving a, a longer life. And uh, one of them is uh, severe calorie restriction. If you take in a good 30, 40, maybe even 50 percent less than the daily recommended calorie intake for adults, our size, our age, chances are you'll live longer. But then a wag said, you may not live longer, but it'll feel like a lot <laughs> longer. And, uh, and at, a previous, uh, at a previous conference, uh, I had a guy who was trying to live that life and was measuring his food. And, and in the middle of the summer, he was swathed in uh, three or four layers of clothes. His nose was running. Uh, it was not an appealing uh, picture, but, but he was doing it for science. He, he was serious. Uh, the only other efforts to extend life, we had a guy here, Michael Rose, uh, a boy from Montreal now uh, in the US, a uh, major academic. And he had succeeded in uh, extending the life of fruit flies. Documented, real science, extending it by a multiple of two, and then three, and I think four. And it turns out he did it by restricting the ability of these fruit flies to have sex, to reproduce. And I thought, that's not much fun. <laughs> so uh, we searched out the next uh, best experiments with advancing the age of uh, creatures, and, and it turns out it's worms. And, and so we have the world expert on the aging of worms and the life extension of worms, and he is Stuart Kim an age scientist. Moses. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you so much, Moses, for inviting me here. Um, it's just an honor to be able to, to talk to you. Um, Moses and the rest of you, I have a, uh, an inside hint about caloric restriction. So caloric restriction does make, as far as we can tell, any uh, all the animals live longer, and probably humans would live longer if you could caloric restrict enough. But the key isn't what you eat, it's what you think you eat. Because you can take a fly, and if the fly cannot smell the food, it still lives long, even if it's eating a lot. And if the fly doesn't eat and is starving itself, but you let it smell the food, it lives short. So it's what you think you eat that makes you live long. And so you could. Um, according to the fly, we could get at the benefits of living long as long as you don't think about it. So there are other tricks you could do. It's got to be easier than uh, starving yourself. So I'm a science researcher on aging. Um, 
I really, really like to think about aging. And it's, to me, there's nothing more interesting about understanding why we age and, and what is it about, um, about us that, that gives us something like 80 years and not much more than, than, than 80 years. Um, so, yes, the lifespan has been increasing, but our maximal lifespan, the longest that you can ever live, it's been something like 90 or 100 years, and it's been like that forever. 3,000 years ago, it was still 90 or 100 years. So, 1,000 BC, and ancient Greeks um, lived to be 100 years old. Uh, Hippocrates, who was the guy that wrote the Hippocratic Oath, lived to be 92. And Sophocles, a guy who wrote um, really famous tragic plays, lived to be 90. And so, all of this phenomenal medicine and science and, 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 and CAT scans and MRIs, they can get you up to your maximal lifespan, but we can't crack the maximal lifespan. So I want to talk about what is it that is, our, uh, is limiting our, our lives. And so let me just start by the, by the world record holder. And that's um, this person here. Her name is uh, Jean Calment. She lived in France, uh, born in Arles, but, now, uh, but lived in, in, in Paris. And it's 122 years. She lived to be 122 years. She was absolutely remarkable. Uh, at age 85, she started to fence. At age 100, she started to bicycle. At age 116, she gave up smoking. <laughs> and because she couldn't see so well, and she was worried she was going to bur burn down her apartment. And so she suffered uh, without, um, uh, without smoking. So there's a joke in there, something about if you smoke for 100 years, it's healthy for you, something like that. <clears throat> now, when she was 90, she lived in this nice apartment in Paris. And a lawyer uh, got to know her and said, here's a single uh, lady living in Paris in this nice uh, condominium, and I want that condominium. So this lawyer, Francois Ruffray, he goes up to Jean Camon and he says, sell me your nice condominium. And Jean Camon says, no, I can't do that because where would I live? So the lawyer says, I have a deal for you. I'll let you live in your apartment. I'll pay for the rent of the apartment all the days of your life, but you sell me that apartment at the end. And she said, okay, fine, because what am I going to do when, I, when I'm gone? I get the apartment. So a year goes by, and two years go by, he's paying for the rent. Five years go by, 10 years go by, he's paying for the rent. 20 years go by, the lawyer dies. And then the widow, the widow had to pay for the rent. 32 years, she lived in that apartment, uh, and then she passed away at, a, at 122 years. Uh, the oldest person in the world today is 114 years. Six billion people in the world, there's only three people at 114. It's hard to live that old. And um, I don't think we're going to break the 122-year record for the next 10 years, 20 years. I mean, it might be one of you guys, hopefully, that can break it, but it's going to take a long time because not for the near... We know all of the people that are over 100, and it's not obvious that any of them have the kind of vitality that Jean Calment had, okay? So that's point one. But that's narrow. That's just looking at us as people, uh, as humans. And so I just argued that we have something pretty serious that's going to limit our lifespan to 100, and 100 years. But let's look broader. Let's look at all the animals in the world and see if they can tell us something about what they do to live shorter and live longer. So here are some of the animals. Let's start with the uh, chimpanzee. Chimpanzee has DNA that's 99% identical to our DNA. Very, very, very similar types of genes in the chimpanzee to a human. And it has a 40-year lifespan. So two-fold difference with just 1% change in the, in the genome tells you that um, you don't have to go very far to, to, to alter your lifespan by twofold. Then there are some uh, animals that age faster than us. Your pet dog ages a lot faster than us, seven, seven times faster. So the way to think about this is that to your dog, we're immortal. So your dog is born as a puppy, 
and you're middle-aged, grows up to be a dog, and you're middle-aged, an old dog, you're still middle-aged, and this dog is thinking, God, my master is immortal. You know, this guy's never going to age. And then he goes through his whole li lifespan. Well, there are animals like that to us. They're animals that we can't see age because their lifespans are so long. So let's think about a whale. A whale can live over 200 years. This whale is called a bowhead whale. And we know it lives 200 years because they went out into the wild and they caught a bunch of bowhead whales and they have fancy ways to look at how old they think it is. But I know the bowhead whale can live 200 years because they found a harpoon in the bowhead whale. And on the harpoon it said, Joe the Eskimo, 1770. And that they knew that the, es that the, har that the whale had lived and gotten hit by uh, the harpoon in, in the 1700s. We don't know how long a whale can live because whales that would have been 300, whales that would have been 400 years, they all died from the whalers. So we have no idea. Maybe the whalers were out there when they first saw whales. Maybe they were killing whales that were 300 and 400 years old. We don't know. So now that the whaling has stopped, maybe we'll start to see what is the, the maximal lifespan of this warm-blooded mammal like us. And um, I would love to know what do they do that we don't do, because we're not going to live uh, 200 years unless we do something drastic. Now, the world's, in the animal kingdom, the, the record holder is a clam. So that's the thing that lives the longest of any, any, anything anybody has found so far. So, that thing is called the quahog clam. Um, on the East Coast, you can eat it in chowder. Um, this one was caught in Iceland, and it uh, was 450 years old when they caught it. So let me make a couple points. First off, um, I don't know why the Iceland scientists named uh, Iceland clam Ming. Maybe they <laughs> thought it walked from China and then got to Iceland. I don't know what they were thinking about. You know, I'm glad they didn't do genetic experiments and look at the progeny from the clam, because then what would they name that? Like Ming Dotir or something like that? And then <laughs> that would be even weirder. Um, tonight, they might serve us clams at dinner. If you eat a clam and it's really, really, really tough, Maybe that's because it's 400 years old, and you just bit into something that was, uh, that, you know, um, it's 400 years old. Okay, so in the DNA of that clam is the secret to, um, to life that's, that's um, they call it negligible senescence, and that's just a fancy word for saying we have no idea how long that clam can live. Okay, so let me just summarize what I've just told you. So here's a... Um, a graph of all the lifespans, and it's look at it, it's, it's a tenfold, tenfold differences. So it goes from one year to 10 years to 100 years. And I told you about the clam that's at 450 years and the whale that's at 200 years. We're at something like 80 years or so is um, median lifespan. Dogs are at maybe 17 years. Mice live two years. Um, and fruit flies, mice and fruit flies are main model organisms for us research scientists. And the fruit fly lives two months, and the, and the fastest aging um, model organism is this animal called a nematode. It's a kind of worm, and I'll show you that in a minute. But a nematode lives only two weeks, which is one four thousandth our lifespan, and that means it's, it's like that. So us scientists can, can, can look at it and try to figure out why is its lifespan just two weeks and not 80 years and not 200 years. That's the idea. OK, so here's a picture of the, of the animal I'm, I'm, I've been talking about. There's a, there's a middle-aged nematode. It's, um, it's got a lot of the genes we have, and so the same types of um, you know, cellular genes and control genes and transcription factors that are in the human genome are present in the, in the worm genome has similar kinds of organs, believe it or not. It has an intestine, and it has skin, um, kidney, and things like that. Uh, it's pretty simple. All it does is it eats and has sex. That's it. Um, OK, and so here's an old worm. This is like an 80-year-old, year 80 in human years. It's in the nursing home. It can't move. Uh, it, can just, it can just move its head from side to side and eat a little bit. So uh, it's not really mobile. 
Okay. So what we wanted to do as a research community is try to figure out what's the nature of the clock for aging in this animal uh, and then other animals. And finally, that might give us you know, the theoretical basis to understand the clock for aging in people. So let me tell you about um, what we found. And the idea is you start off as a young, as a young worm, and then this clock rolls. And something about being a worm means that clock rolls with two weeks as its, as its time. Our clock goes much, much, much slower, and we have 80 years. And then other animals, we can't even see the clock move. It's going so slow. That's the idea. What is this clock? And I'll tell you, um, pretty recent data coming out that uh, give us a, a clue. It's really surprising, because it's not like what your grandparents thought the clock was. Grandparents thought the clock was it was damage accumulation. And that's not what we saw. OK, so I need to explain this. We saw that there were these three regulatory proteins called ELT5, ELT6, and ELT3. A regulatory protein is a transcription factor. And a transcription factor um, regulates the expression of a whole bunch of downstream genes. So hopefully you remember your high school biology uh, and know what transcription factors are. Um, ELT3 is an activating transcription factor, and it turns on downstream genes. ELT5 and 6 are repressor transcription factors, and they turn off downstream genes. And what's going on, and what we found out, is that in old worms, the activating transcription factor had declined, and you lost this turning on of genes. And the repressor genes had gone up, and you saw too much repression of downstream genes. So there was this massive dysregulation of genetic regulation in old worms. Um, so let me say that again. The old worm wasn't like a young worm. It was fundamentally different. It had changed to a different kind of a state. And it was lacking certain genes that were turned down, and other genes were repressed. And so it had these specific problems in how it was going to um, be able to carry out its cellular functions. Okay? And then what we did is we undid that. So we took the activator gene, and we turned it back up. And we took the repressor genes, and we turned them back down. And this set the, the network back towards the younger state. So all of that means we then looked at, um, I'm sorry, I've got to explain this. this. This is what I just told you. Here is a young worm with three red dots that indicate the activator transcription factor turning on three different um, target genes. In the old worm, there's not three red dots. It's just one red um, blob, which means that the activating had gone down. And now we didn't get three genes turned on, we just get one gene turned on. And over here is, um, indicates it's not just three genes, it's really 900 genes that are getting turned down as the worm gets older. Okay? That was our model for what was going on with the worm. Up above, you can see a real worm. Here's the green is this activating transcription factor. And now there's less green in the old worm. And less green means that old worm is in serious problem because it's lost a major regulator that it needs in order to perform cellular functions. OK. We turn on that activating transcription factor, and look what happened. We made this worm. This worm is 200 years old in human years. And it's moving like a middle-aged person. So it's like, it's like a 200-year-old worm that acts like a 40-year-old worm. Okay? So that's not so bad. That's not 100 years in the nursing home. That's delaying aging uh, for a long, long, long time. And in worms and in flies especially, it's possible to do these kinds of massive transformations where you can get worms to live two times, three times, four times longer than, than normal. And it's giving us clues as to what it's going to take to make other animals live longer. OK. This changed how I think about, about aging. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how. The old model was that <clears throat> an old animal was sort of like an old car. And you bring your old car into the mechanic, and you say, like, what's wrong with my old car? It doesn't go, any, doesn't go very fast. 
anymore. And, and the old model was that's because of rust and that the, it, your, your, your old animal looked like an old car like that. Every part had been rusted out. That's called molecular damage and the oxidative damage theory of aging. And then there was no way to really stop that because there's no way you could really rejuvenate the old car. You'd have to replace essentially every part. That's not what we saw. We saw that there were specific, very specific problems with this car, this old animal, that the activator was no longer pressed down and that the repressors were pressed down too hard. So it was like the gas pedal wasn't pressed and the brakes were pressed and that's why the car wasn't moving very fast. Now that's really different because that's easier to fix. Bring that, problem, that car into the mechanic and all the mechanic has to do is press down the gas pedal and take off the brakes and the car is going to move faster. And that's the worm I, sh I showed you. So then let me just leave you with um, two thoughts about stuff that we're working on and hoping to see in our research labs in the, next, in the near future. The first is, this allows for the theoretical possibility of rejuvenation. So if old animals are like rusted cars, you can't rejuvenate them. But if it's gas pedal and, and brakes, you could take a car, an old animal that's not moving very fast, and just give it the gas pedal again and take off the brakes and it'll rejuvenate. So we're trying to rejuvenate animals. It's theoretically possible. I'd love to tell you that we can do it uh, soon. The other thing that's kind of neat is you can look for the same kinds of principles going on in people and in mice. So in mice, there's, I think there's pretty good evidence that something similar is going on and that an old mouse is losing certain um, activating regulatory things. They're called wind proteins and it's turning on certain repressor proteins like a cell cycle repressor. And so there is similar drift of these developmental control patterns in old mice. Maybe there'll be similar drift in old people, and this will give us a clue as to what it's going to take to understand our clock for being 80 years and not 200 years. Thank you very much. How do, you, how, do you, how do you push the accelerator and retract the brake on that little worm? What, what, do you have to inject it with something? Do you cut something out? How, how do you do that? Well, we, I'm a geneticist, so geneticists go in and they mod, modulate the DNA. So to make the activator go on more, we just give it more genes for the activator factor. Mm -hmm. And to turn off the brake, we simply inhibit the gene for the brakes. You so that's exactly what we did. We inhibited the brake gene and we, we gave extra copies of the activator gene. You, you, you seize these genes from within the creature itself? Well, we, or do you go to the gene store? <laughs> uh, well, we clone the genes. We use recombinant DNA. Mm. Uh, we probably made them in bacteria, took the DNA from the bacteria and then put the DNA into the worm. Um, that's how we turn, we added extra gene copies to the worm. And then there's a trick to, to turn down genes in the worm that we want to. And so as geneticists, we can now turn up and turn down genes at will in, in, in model organisms. Um, so, so that was relatively straightforward. And, and this business of being, <laughs> <laughs> of being able to model the human genome, does that mean you could eventually uh, possibly do that in a human being. Once you've read my <laughs> genome. Yeah? Look at if in the Jules Verne sense that he could make a submarine, and in the Michael Crichton sense that he could make a dinosaur, you could, you could, you could figure out human aging. Like, I can't do this next year. But in our lifespan, I'm sure that, I'm pretty sure that we could do this scientifically. Ethically, is the, is the issue. One is, you know, would you, what are the ethics for going into your DNA and changing your DNA so that you have a much extended lifespan? Is that even ethically possible? And, and then socially, is that socially desirable and what would that do to the economic system of the country? Those are problems that I'm not really qualified to, to weigh in on. I think a lot of the other speakers are much better at that. But scientifically, I think we would know, I think we could know how to do it. And you think within our lifestyle? That's right. Wow. 
Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you have your time? Do you have your name, I do. Yeah. Okay, Thanks a lot. Well, that's encouraging, but don't you always have the sneaking suspicion <laughs> that that breakthrough is going to come the day after? 